um, as far as things. So if you put something in the chat, we'll monitor it and I'll be happy to answer those. Um, today, we're going to talk about outpatient total joint replacement. I know, you know, a lot of people, we've talked about joint replacement and things in the past. Um, today, we're going to talk specifically about outpatient joint replacement. Just a little bit about my background um, and how we got to Knoxville. My wife and I are both from Tennessee, but more the western side of the state in the Memphis area. And then I did my med school in Memphis, and then I did residency at Columbia, Missouri, and then we did fellowship uh, for a year in uh, DC. And then that's uh, kind of the path that led us back to Knoxville after being in kind of some Midwest areas and a little bit of the Northeast, we wanted to be back in the South. And that's how we ended up uh, back here. Kind of today, we're gonna to talk about outpatient joints. We're gonna review arthritis. We'll talk about some conservative management, surgical interventions, anterior hip replacement, robotic knees, um, and really it's outpatient joints, but kind of the point I'm going to drive home today a little bit is that doing total joints as outpatient procedures isn't one thing that kind of flips that switch and allows us to do it. It's a lot of different little things that we've just perfected over years and have gotten better and better that's allowed medicine to move us to the point of doing outpatient um, joint replacement. Uh, as far as when you look at celebrities with joint replacements, there's a long list of them, and this isn't all of them, um, of people that have had some form of joint replacement. Most notably in this area, Coach Saban actually just last year had his knee replaced with the Mako robot that we will talk about a little later. So what is outpatient joint replacement? Well, there's multiple definitions and it depends who you're talking to. There's a different answer if it's your insurance company versus your surgeon versus a hospital or a surgery center. Most of the time when surgeons talk about outpatient surgery, whether that's joint replacement or a knee scope or a hip scope or something on your hand or any kind of outpatient surgery, we're referring to surgery that is done where the patient goes home the same day. The location of that could vary. It could be done at a hospital and you go home the same day. It could be done at a surgery center and you go home the same day. But when we say outpatient, that's typically what we mean. We can get into other definitions of it um, later if there are questions around it, but there are also other definitions for insurance companies that are based on comorbidities of whether something's inpatient or outpatient. But really when your doctor talks about it, he's really just saying, are you going home that same day of surgery or are you staying overnight? So first off, uh, I am a hip and knee specialist. That's, that's what I do. We're gonna talk about arthritis. This is some general stuff, but really specific to hip and knee. Um, as far as arthritis, the most common form is what we call osteoarthritis. This is mainly a genetic thing passed down from your family members. Uh, it's slow, it's progressive, it's degenerative, uh, you wear out the joint. There are also inflammatory arthritis conditions, and then there can be post-traumatic arthritis conditions. Who gets arthritis? Um, one in five adults has been diagnosed with some kind of arthritis. One in four people will probably eventually see someone over painful hip arthritis, and two in every three people will see a doctor at some point in their life over painful arthritis in some joint. Arthritis, if you think about the, the joint, your, your hips, your knees, all of your joints are really made to be the most, most frictionless surface that we know of. And so when you have perfect cartilage on perfect cartilage, it runs smoothly, there are no bumps, it's like a fresh tires on a brand new paved road. What happens with arthritis is those little, those, that cartilage that is supposed to be super smooth and not have a lot of friction gets these little potholes. And then it's also like getting tires that have worn out. And when you start running those on the surfaces together, you start having a lot more pain, a lot of loss of most motion and decreased function. How do we diagnose arthritis? It's mainly diagnosed from history, what you tell us when we're talking to you, then physical exam, and in addition, we get x-rays. Most of the time, this is sufficient to diagnose arthritis. However, there are some times when uh, we need something more like an MRI 
or another study, but typically these three things will get us to the diagnosis for arthritis. A little bit about anatomy. When we talk about the hip, it's a ball and socket joint. So if you look over here um, on the right side of the screen, there's a ball that's called the femoral head, and then there's the socket that's called the acetabulum. And um, when you look at it, it's supposed to have a fluid layer in there that's going on all the time that's lubricating that. You also have your labrum and the synovium and the hip capsule around it, but these are the basics of, of that anatomy, okay? These are what some hip x-rays look like. This, on the left side here, you'll see a normal left hip that has a ball, it has the socket, it has clear space in between those two bones. That's where normal cartilage is. We don't see soft tissue like the labrum or the hip capsule or your abductor muscles. We can't see those on x-ray. Um, so we just represent really the bones and the spaces where cartilage exists. Then when you look here on the right side of the screen, you see a femoral head or the ball and you see the socket, but you don't see any space here in between the two. And that would be an arthritic hip. You also see these bone spurs down here inferiorly and kind of this extra bone. These are bone spurs around the hip. In regards to um, treatment options, when we talk about arthroscopy, I get a lot of questions about, can you do a hip scope and the answer when we're dealing with arthritis is typically no. It, arthroscopy or just doing a scope where we go in there with a couple of small poke holes and uh, treat it does not work well for arthritis. It works really well for labral tears and hip impingement, but it does not work well for arthritis. A little knee anatomy. Again, it's the same thing. The knee is a little more complex joint than the ball and socket of the hip, but it's a hinged joint or a gliding joint. And uh, you look, it's coated in cartilage all the way around. You also have these meniscus, the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus that are your shock absorbers in the knee. And then you have a lot more ligaments that we define and we talk about a lot around the knee um, with the lateral collateral ligaments, the medial collateral ligaments, your ACL, one that we kind of talk about a lot with um, athletes, and then your PCL. Same thing, we're looking at x-rays now. Um, x-ray here on the right side, again, the femur is up on top. This circle here is the shadow of the patella. Remember, x-rays are a 2D representation of your bones. So it's a 2D uh, image that's really representing a 3D structure. And then you see the space here and your tibia and your fibula down here. When we look on the right side of the screen, you see how there's no space. It looks much more degenerative, much less smooth. It has these extra spurs all around it. And you can even see on this x-ray where the bone is starting to shift over here, where it's shifting off to the medial side. Arthroscopy for arthritis does not work in the knee either. When we talk about a clean out or doing something arth arthroscopically for a knee, we're most of the time talking about this bottom picture here where we're dealing with a meniscus that's torn and we go in and we can trim that out. On the top, you'll see what I was talking about. It's that pristine, normal looking, very smooth cartilage. That's what we want to see. This would be a very normal appearance of a joint. When we talk treatment options for arthritis, whether it's the hip or the knee, they overlap. It's rest, ice, compression, elevation, therapy, anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, Aleve. Some people can't take those and we have to only use Tylenol. Other people prefer to avoid um, medications and we can talk about things like curcumin, which is an active ingredient in uh, turmeric that a lot of people have uh, relief with using that as a natural supplement. Their injections, whether those are steroids or PRP or visco supplementation, like gel shots. Um, and then lastly, the kind of one that we'll talk about a little more is surgery. The bottom line is, though, we don't have the ability to put cartilage back once it's lost in the knee, uh, especially in an arthritic setting. In a young athlete, um, our young adults, there are some cartilage procedures. They are still very... Um, 
useful in those settings, but once the joint has become arthritic or has that kind of global inflammation and irritation in it, uh, putting cartilage back does not work well. As far as what surgery entails, uh, we're talking about joint replacement and our goals are really to relieve pain and improve function. And really what I'm looking for is to be able to get patients back to their normal lifestyle and the activities they wanna enjoy. Common question I have a lot of times around surgery is should I have it? Um, one, I wanna stress that most of the time when I'm talking 99% of the time for hip replacement and knee replacement, we're talking about elective surgery when we're dealing with arthritis. That means that it's my job to tell you you're a candidate for it. And it's my job to tell you that I can help you with it, but it's your choice as the patient whether or not you ever have surgery. Now, insurance does do a good job of covering these things, but it is your choice. Um, as far as one response that I get way too often uh, from patients is the fact that they just wish they hadn't waited so long. We have a tendency to try to avoid surgery and too often um, patients come in and they'll be back a month after surgery and they're like, I just wish I hadn't waited so long. So it's a very common thing for people to comment on after surgery. Specifically about hip replacements. And again, this is that additive effect that I'm um, looking to express when we talk about outpatient joints is that approach and how we do things matters. And so anterior approach hip replacement allows me to go in from the front of the hip. We do not cut into any muscles during this procedure that makes the recovery faster. It also decreases the number of precautions and motions that we have to give patients not to do after surgery. So we don't have any precautions after surgery. We also are able to use navigation software and X-ray imaging during the surgery to make sure that your hip replacement is as perfect as possible. And when done in experienced hands, it's very successful and patients do very well with it. Uh, let's see. When we talk about, hold on, I'm gonna clear the annotation. Somebody's uh, drawn on my screen. Um, when we look at hip arthritis and a hip replacement. This is uh, two images here. On the left side of the screen here, you see that arthritic hip that's worn out. There's no more space. And this is what a new hip replacement looks like. And what we have is we have the socket or the acetabular component that is a metal. The ones uh, we use are 3D printed or made through additive manufacturing. It, the back side of those are made to match up with your bone. So the back side structure of that is made so that your bone grows into it. Um, and this gives us the best long-term fixation for the parts. There's then a plastic liner or what we call polyethylene. This is kind of the clear space you see here and here. And then there's the ball that's ceramic. That's called the new femoral head. And then we, this is the femoral component here or the femoral stem. And it again is press fit or put into the femur so tight that it fits um, perfectly. If I were to try to move your leg um, or move that part, it's so tight in there, your whole leg will move if I try to move it. Uh, there was a comment of, can I still jog after a knee replacement? It, a lot of surgeons have differing opinions on this. And I have a slide that addresses some of this activity later, but. The short answer is yes. Do we recommend it as a full-time activity? Uh, most surgeons don't. I don't really put those restrictions on my patient, but I will, I'm gonna talk about that again as we come to it. This is the newest thing that we have, and this is the robotic assisted surgery. And uh, this is a hot topic. I've done several talks on this by itself, and I know some of my partners have. But when we talk about robotics, I'm specifically talking about this robot. This is the Mako robot. And um, we now have two of these at the hospital at Park West. We have one at our surgery center that's directly above me. I'm so passionate about this uh, instrument, uh, specifically around knees, that um, we only we got it upstairs at the surgery center because I would not move my patients there until I had it. So I'm very passionate about this product. I feel what robotics and anterior approach and x-rays and all these things are doing is trying to increase our precision and increase our accuracy 
so that we match these joint replacements up as perfectly as we can so that every patient has an individualized uh, joint replacement that matches what their anatomy and their knee or hip needs um, so that they can function at their highest level. Just to see kind of what I see with uh, robotic surgery, this is uh, looking at a knee of a patient. I'll show you the, the old knee x-ray that I showed you first. This was his x-ray. And these are his uh, parts as kind of we looked at them to line them up at the time of surgery. We then uh, look down here and measure all these gaps and plan this out. And we can move this knee replacement around by millimeters before I ever have cut your bone or done um, kind of the finer parts of surgery, we are adjusting where this implant is and adjusting it by millimeters and degrees to get it to align perfectly for each patient. Again, this is just showing another level of how much measurements, how many measurements and how much precision is going into this so that we ensure that these are perfect for each patient. I'm gonna click and play this video. This is showing you what the robotic saw does. Um, we get a lot of questions about this. I don't just turn it over and the robot does it. It only works when I am squeezing the trigger and when I'm allowing it to go forward and backwards and it's not going anywhere that I haven't told it to do. So I'm gonna start playing this video and you look here as I'm lining it up, we lock it into place, so it adjusts and locks into place, and then I get that green sign and it gives power to the saw. But in addition to what I'm doing in controlling it, we have haptic boundaries or boundaries that if I get into those or we try to go into those, the saw will shut off. It actually will not function and it will not let you extend outside of the boundaries that are set to ensure that we make these very precise, very accurate cuts for each patient, which includes increasing the safety so that we don't damage other tissues around the knee. This is uh, that knee replacement after we finished it um, for, for this patient. If you look on the left side, that was his arthritic knee. And then, um, and then on the right side is the newly replaced knee. And this is him that day when he was getting ready to go home. This is about two hours after his surgery. And we saw him up on the floor, he's in his clothes and he's getting ready to go home. When we talk about a comprehensive outpatient joint program, I'm really talking about a, several things. And one of those includes the medications and how we handle things pre and post operatively. So I'm giving you pain medications. We're treating your pain and inflammation before you ever have surgery. Because I know that when I start my surgery, you're going to start having some of those things. So we start treating the pain before surgery. That includes blocks that the anesthesiologist can do at times. It includes preoperative magic medications. And then in surgery, we're doing injections all around the knee or the hip. We're giving the patients anti-nausea medicine so that you don't wake up from anesthesia with uh, a lot of nausea. And then after surgery, we no longer just give patients narcotics. It used to be we just used a lot of narcotics and we weren't that um, precise or accurate in treating all different types of pain. We were just giving everybody Percocet or another kind of narcotic drug and treating pain that way. And what we found is what we really need to do is treat all the different kinds of pain. There's inflammation, there's nerve pain, and then there are some, some pain that it just the opiates or the narcotics are needed to help. Not everybody does narcotics after surgery. I have more and more patients now that are using non-narcotic alternatives to uh, manage their pain after surgery. That's not for everybody yet, but we have promising things and a lot of studies and data are heading in that direction where hopefully one day we're able to do this without narcotics. It also includes for a joint program is early mobilization. Patients do a lot better the quicker we get them up and moving after a surgery. So the faster we have you up and moving, the less time all that inflammation and stiffness has to set in. So they get up and move faster. What does recovery look like? So when we do surgeries here at our surgery center or an outpatient surgery at the hospital, most patients are gonna leave somewhere between two and four hours after surgery. 
But if we need to keep patients longer than that, it is okay. Um, I tell all of my patients and all the families, my goal isn't to get you out of here in a certain time. My goal is to get you out of here safely. So I want safety to be the goal of everything that we do. And so we're not going to let somebody go home if they haven't done all the things that we've set as criteria to be able to go home. That includes standing, walking. We teach people to do stairs. If you have stairs at your house that you're going to need to use when you go home, we make sure that you're comfortable using your walker or a cane or crutches, whichever one we, we choose with the patient that will work best for them. Even with all the things we're doing, surgery is not pain-free. It does hurt. You have pain from the incisions and the muscles and the tissue around it. But the things we have done have decreased that significantly and patients recover a lot faster when we're talking about anterior hips and when we're talking about robotic knees. Pain for these is typically temporary. Most patients will recover and by two to four weeks, they're walking around without any assistive device and doing very well. Walking is a crucial point of recovery for both hip and knee replacement. And it's a vital kind of thing that we have people do every day. In addition, on knee replacement, we spend a lot of time working on their motion very early. So when you look at this, uh, you're walking with a walker in the first 24 hours for up to about a week. And then typically about the one to two week mark, patients transition to a cane. Typically somewhere around two to four weeks, people transition off of the cane and are walking around unassisted. And I do encourage people, especially at different times of the year, like winter, to keep canes on them longer, especially if you're gonna get out. I find that when you go to the grocery store, you go to the mall, if you have a cane with you, people give you just a little more space. They get that door for you and are a little nicer. And I like that for my patients because I don't want somebody else to trip them and cause them to fall. Driving is a common question we get. There's nothing that we as physicians sign to or say that tells people when they can and can't drive. The rules for driving are that you cannot be taking a narcotic and you have to be able to slam on the brake like a kid runs out in front of your car. So typically people return to driving around about two weeks, but some people are longer, uh, especially if we operate on the right side. So if we operate on your right leg, uh, for most people, that's the one they use for gas and brake, and their recovery or return to driving can be slower. Whereas if we operate on the left leg, it tends to be a little bit faster. Return to work is probably one of the toughest questions I get asked because it's different for everybody. I have had people go back at two weeks after a surgery. I've had people take three months before they return to work, depending on their job and what they needed to do. It also depends on what kind of time off they have and what would benefit them the most. The main thing is we want to return safely and not to the point where it's going to hurt the patient when they go back. When we talk about higher end activities, um, as we enter into golf season around here, um, typically people are starting to do a lot more chipping and putting around the two week or the two month mark after surgery. And then hopefully by three months, they've worked their way through their irons and down to using uh, their drivers so that by that three month mark, most of them are back to golfing, even if you don't have the conditioning that you had beforehand. When we talk about high, high end activities, skiing, running, hiking, those are more around the four to six month mark. Um, specifically with that, there was one study done at as far as high functioning activities. And when we looked at how patients did out of the people they evaluated that were doing more than two to four hours a day of high impact activity, um, they did not have any failures in, in the 10 years that they ran the study of patients doing kind of normal one to two to three hours of high impact activity a day. There was one failure, but that person had returned to doing about six hours a day of very high repetitive use motions like running and exercise at a level that was past what everybody else had recommended. And he did have a failure and had to go back to surgery. But overall, these things now are really made to last you close to your lifetime. So again, um, how long will it last? They should last you close to your lifetime. In the human body, we have data out to about 23 years currently on the current generation of implants without failure secondary to the wear out of the plastic or the parts themselves. So the current generation are lasting longer than anything did before it. 
in the uh, simulators, they have run these through cycles to the point where they feel like they can say lifetime on these things, but that is not in the human body. Um, your joint replacements can wear out or loosen, but we do have better and better results with revision joint replacement or going back in to swat, uh, to swip, excuse me, to switch out the plastic liner, which is typically what would wear out in the past. So when you used to hear about things only lasting five and 10 years, the failures at those time were the plastic liners or the shock absorber. We are not seeing that anymore. The current generation are lasting at least 20 years. Overall, if you take all causes, including somebody going and being in, in an accident or having a fall, there's about a 1% failure rate per year. So in summary, arthritis is a life limiting disease. It does keep people from doing the stuff that they want to do. Um, we've kind of gone over operative and non-operative treatment options. This is a very successful high-end surgery. Patients do phenomenal with it, and we have great long-term results. Uh, anterior approach and robotic-assisted um, surgery has increased our precision and our accuracy. It's decreased the pain and difficulty for patients after surgery, and they have a faster recovery. Um, outpatient surgery, again, if that's in the hospital setting or at our surgery center, has been shown to be equally as safe as doing this where we keep people overnight. So patients are doing better and going home sooner than they ever have before. Um, and really, it's hard to put outpatient surgery into just one thing because it takes all these things from anesthesia um, through how we do the surgery to the medications before and after surgery to get patients that best outcome where they're functioning long-term with this. Does anybody have any questions? 